Okay, so um, a couple of uh, quick reminders. The um, so this is the last uh, the last part of this unit, unit G. Uh, the unit comprehension assignment is available. I think it's due Sunday. Um, there is also the very very short status update for your creative projects, which is due Saturday. I think you can turn it in up to Sunday without a penalty. Um, not looking for much there. Again, a paragraph at most. Basically, say, uh, remind me what in a sentence or two you were basically doing. Let me know if that's still your plan. Um, if it was, if it is still your plan, let me know if you've had um, any interesting developments, good or bad. If it isn't your plan, um, let me know what your new plan is. And um, uh, and and basically, you know, if there's any wrinkles you are kind of expecting moving forward. So there's a rubric online for how to do that. You don't have to tell me very much. Again, a paragraph, but sort of in most, it's just kind of a check in to see where things are. It may be that your plan is still your original plan. And you haven't really done a whole lot on it. That's totally fine. You just want to kind of state that um, I just sort of want like a, a record that everybody's got their creative projects in mind and sort of has a um, a next action moving forward. Um, and uh, then the other only other things uh, are, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, money's points, of course, as usual. Um, next week, there is a reading. Um, actually, this week, sorry, this week, there's a reading on Thursday. That reading is available, the, the exercise as well as the perusal. Um, and, um, and then next week, there's a reading on Thursday as well. And the week after that, our final reading is on Thursday. And so I'm almost done with the reading exercise for next week. So that'll be up soon. And the unit comprehension the assignment will be up soon uh, once I kind of decide on um, how I'm going to round out that unit. So any uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah, in the in your initial proposal, I, I gave at least a couple words of feedback on everybody. So if you go through grades and then click on your initial proposal, you should be able to see feedback within the rubric and in the comments. And if there was something that I thought was like, whoa, this is like way wrong, or it's like, I would have said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I mean, I read all of the proposals kind of in detail. Uh, I, uh, if you have specific questions, I would just send me a note, and then I can go into it and say I generally liked ninety five percent of it, and there was maybe this sort of rough stuff, but I thought you'd sort of, you know, round that out as you were going. Um, so, uh, so if you're if you're worried, send me a note, and I can take a closer look and give you detailed feedback. Uh huh. Any other questions? Anything moving forward? Of course, don't forget the drop policies and other things get busy at the end of the semester with all your other courses and things. Um, so, you know, you drop the lowest three of the reading uh, exercises, as well as the lowest three of the perusals, the lowest six of the unit comprehension assignments. Of course, the more you can do of these, I think the more you can kind of be prepared for the final exam. But um, if you feel pretty prepared, I don't want you to feel like you're doing busy work in the class when you've got a lot of other things you can do this semester. So um, it I, it does not reflect negatively on you if you already have like a good score in the reading exercise category and you say, I'm just not going to do this reading exercise. I might still send you reminders, as I sometimes do, um, to sort of say, oh, by the way, the due date's coming up, you haven't submitted this yet, but um, but if you really have like done the math and you say, you know what, it's uh, my, my grade won't be helped by this, then I can spend that time doing other things. That's totally up to you. You shouldn't feel bad about that. So just keep in mind that those policies are there, as I know things will get busy in the rest of your classes this semester now, too. All right. So there were a couple of things that I wanted to um, to, to get to um, the last one. So I decided to, um, we had sort of a spare lecture, I wasn't sure what to do with at the end. And so I moved it forward so I could finish what we were talking about uh, last week, at the end of last week. So there's sort of this fifth lecture in this unit G, um, and that was what pushed everything back forward. So um, so where we were last time, let me focus my mouse on PowerPoint. So, um, so where we were last time, and oh, actually, let me, um, just for the sake of better video sharing here, I'm going to temporarily go. 
there. All right, sorry about that. So, um, so last time we, um, uh, we were talking about these examples kind of related to kind of trail laying and things like that, and just generally an introduction of kind of ants and social insects, but then kind of uh, mentioned that uh, slime mold has this sort of interesting, it's not a social insect, it's a single cell, no neurons or anything like that, but it can still solve interesting problems. And uh, one of the things that it does is it distributes itself among multiple alternatives. And then once it gathers up another enough information inside the cell, it then makes kind of a switch where it can commit. So um, I have colleagues that can take slime mold and they can put it on a line and they can put, you know, low density, like a, a low concentration food on one side, a high concentration food on the other. It will spread out and cover both foods. And then at some point um, it will kind of give up exploiting both foods and then collapse on just the one that's high concentration. But it first spreads itself out to integrate all that information together. And it kind of allocates itself in proportional to, to food quality. And then that allows it to make decisions that compare alternatives, despite not having any you know, brain or neurons or anything like that. And, um, and honeybees kind of can do this too. We talked a little bit about this, but there were some questions in the muddiest points about the waggle dance and things like that. So I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit more about bees than I was originally planning to here. So, um, so if we talk about um, honeybees, so um, here's an example. This is sort of a famous bee researcher from Cornell named Tom Steely. Um, and it's a little hard to see, um, but this is a box that um, inside it has got um, some frames of a honeybee hive. So um, Tom Steely up at uh, Cornell, he actually, they basically have an island that is uh, devoid of all other bees, except for the bees that he puts there. And so that allows him to do these really amazing field experiments where you can watch these bees and you can do things like tag them. So you can see up here, there's actually a company in Germany that makes tags just for bees. And so you can put these little tags on their back that have colors and numbers and allows you to identify like every bee in a colony and you can watch what every one of them does. Do they leave? Do they go to a particular flower? Do they come back? You can track all that sort of history stuff. And Tom is one of these guys that can sit and watch these frames and be able to, uh, by eye, decode what the bees are dancing for. And I mentioned dancing, that's I talked about last time. So um, this was actually a paper that was um, written in part by uh, my old graduate school advisor. But um, so this is an example where uh, bees are in this tree. Uh, the sun is up in the sky. You can see where it hits the horizon. Um, there are some flowers over here. So if you were to draw a line from where the sun hits the horizon to the tree, uh, that forms one line. The flowers from another line. That's like a 40 degree angle. So if a bee finds one of these flowers and wants to bring other bees to it, then she on a vertical slice of comb um, will end up um, dancing one of these waggle dances. I'll show you a video held here in just a second where um, she will orient the waggle dance to be 40 degrees off of straight up and down. And so uh, the angle here corresponds to the angle here. And as the sun moves in the sky, the bees compensate by changing the angle on the, that they're dancing on the comb. And how long of each one of these waggle dances, um, this is a, called a waggle run, this, this whole distance here, um, going from the start to the end, that's what we call one waggle run. And uh, the length of a waggle run, um, so say the length in time, uh, corresponds to the distance away from the tree. And so you can actually plot out um, you know, the duration of the waggle run in seconds on this axis and the, and the distance to food source on this axis. And you can see it's a pretty uh, linear relationship. So these are real data from real bees. So what does that look like? Well, um, so this is a, a movie uh, taken from uh, in James Nye's lab. So right now there's this red one that has been painted. And, um, and so you can see that she will, is moving in a figure eight, and a bunch of others will, will do this here in a second. So I'll let this run for a while and we'll see it. And so she consistently sort of um, does this waggle run in one uh, direction, which is kind of um, sort of in this direction here. And so she'll keep circling around and when she gets pointed in that direction, she'll start doing the waggle run. But eventually she stops after a certain number of waggle runs. But we can see over here, here's an unmarked one. Uh, well, here's another marked one. 
that uh, and these have been marked because these have been flying out and so you can grab them when they land on a flower and then you can dab them with paint release them and they'll come back and so and then you can say all right this one that was at this flower where is she dancing to and then you can see you know how she is encoding this distance and direction from the flower and so if you look over this um if you get used to that you get that kind of image of the the, the wiggle back and forth um you can start seeing a lot of these wackle rims going on on this so-called dance floor so there's a section of the um, honey uh, bees hive that they use to gather all this information and if you kind of watch those that are doing the waggle runs they've got they get kind of a cluster of five or six bees <clears throat> that follow them like these here as they kind of read that information and then those are the ones that um, over time will start popping off and then going and flying off in that direction and that is the the honeybee waggle dance so any questions about that is that a little clearer pretty pretty interesting there now there were a lot of questions like how do these sort of things evolve um <clears throat> you shouldn't we need uh I didn't get to it but a lot of times when we talk about behavioral ecology the evolution of behavior we talk about how there's sort of four different ways we can ask questions about behavior the function of the behavior the phylogeny of the behavior sort of you don't have to write any of this down but the, the like where it comes evolutionarily like sort of where it evolved from on evolutionary time scales the ontogeny sort of like how did it develop over time you know from baby bee to adult bee um and um <clears throat> and then the actual mechanism so how does it actually work um and someone did ask about learning here and although the waggle dance is instinctual. It turns out that naive bees that have never done a waggle dance before, they're not very good at it. And there has been evidence that naive bees will follow waggle dances of experienced bees and actually learn how to become better waggle dancers over time through their experience watching other waggle dances. So they do learn how to be better, but they know what a, a waggle dance is kind of fundamentally. When you watch a waggle dance, you shouldn't think that the bee is coming back and saying intentionally, how am I going to communicate this to my sisters? Um, it's a lot more potentially like a bee comes back and that bee just sort of says, hmm, I had a sugary treat over there. Um, and, and she has now developed this ritualistic behavior that if you had a sugary treat over there, you come back and you just walk around kind of in the direction of where you had the sugary treat. And there's no intentionality necessarily in the bee. It's just, this is just the pattern. I had a sugary treat, I end up doing that. Kind of like if somebody came back to your apartment or something like that, and if they were, whenever they're eating, they ended up putting their keys one place, but whenever they came back from, you know, from school, they put their keys in another place. Well, now the keys encoded where they were coming from. And it's kind of a similar sort of thing. Similarly, bees that are in the colony, if they happen to notice this, this weird wiggling sort of thing, then they just happen to pick up on the behavior that if a bee is wiggling, <clears throat> then they should fly off in the direction she's wiggling. And that tends to, um, to lead to something that's good for the colony, which tends to produce more brood, which tends to produce more bees that exhibit this phenotype. And that's kind of how these behaviors spread. So it's not so much that the bees are calculating the best way to communicate this information. It's more like there's this ritualized behavior that just happens to happen when you come back from a feeder and when you experience a bee doing that ritualized behavior. So it's, we have to kind of separate the proximate, the mechanism from the ultimate, the adaptation, the why it was selected versus the how it works. Those two things don't overlap generally, even though in the human narrative of why we do things, we often think of them overlapping. So anyways, yeah, so that's the waggle dance. All right, so any other questions about the waggle dance? Is that uh, seem relatively clear? All right, so um, they do that for food, but they also do that for nest site selection, which is gonna be a big subject of what we have here today. It's an interesting decision-making problem that ants and bees um, have to deal with cavity nesters in particular. So honeybees, Western honeybees, the honeybees we have here um, on this side of the world typically live in cavities. So they live inside a tree somewhere. Um, now, what happens is that every year or so, uh, the virgin queens go off, they mate, they come back. And the existing queens then leave the virgin queens with some workers 
and the existing queens then take the rest of the workers with them and they go and they hang out on a tree or a side of a building. In the springtime, how many people have walked around ASU's campus and have seen these bivouacs sometimes hanging out um, on a building or in a tree somewhere? Has anybody ever seen that? If you haven't, look around because, uh, yeah, so it, this does happen pretty frequently. And every once in a while you see caution tape around. Turns out they're pretty docile when they're in this state here. And so what they do, and they hang out on a tree branch uh, or a building, um, and they now start the process of looking for a new nest site. And, um, and so if you were to go up close to it and look at the surface of one of these bivouacs, um, then you'll see a bunch of those waggle dances, like I was just showing there. But now they're not dancing for a food source. They're dancing for a candidate nest site. So some of these bees have found nest candidate A over here. Other bees have found nest candidate B over, uh, over here. What do bees like in a nest site? Well, there's a bunch of things, and you, there are papers written about it, but you know the size of the cavity, whether there's existing comb in there, uh, you know, whether there's uh, dead bees in there, um, all sorts of other things contribute to the multidimensional preference plane of what a honeybee likes. But regardless of what's leading an individual bee to, to be enthusiastic or not, um, these bees were, are searching the environment, finding these, and then coming back and dancing. And they danced on their temporary home to bring new scouts to these sites to check them out. So um, if we look at their dance patterns here, then we can find, well, how is the quality of these different sites communicated? Well, if a bee comes back, and starts dancing, the number of waggle runs on her first trip back from the candidate site seems to uh, be strongly correlated to the quality of that site. So if it's a high quality site, then she might do 40 runs. So she'll do 40 loops around that figure eight, or I guess 20 or something like that, if we think of the half one, but she'll do 40 of those straight runs around that um, to, for a really good quality site. If it's not such a great quality site, when she comes back, she might only do 10. Um, now, as we'll see in a second, um, what's happening in this process here, um, after she's done with her 40, she'll often then leave and then go back to the candidate just to check it out again. But as we'll see in a second, she's likely not checking out the nest again, but she's checking out how many scouts are now accumulated on that nest. And then she'll come back and then she'll do waggle dances. But now instead of doing 40, she might do 35. Or instead of doing 10, she might do five. So every time she comes back to the nest or to this temporary nest location, she does fewer runs in her dance. And that decays. Um, so that now, you know, on her like 10th visit back home, she just might even stop dancing for that site. Like, oh, I recruited for it. I guess we're not going there. I'm going to give up on this one. So um, you can see that high quality sites are going to get lots of dances. Low quality sites are going to get very few dances in this process. So what happens then is if we then watch this process evolve over time, it starts out and you've got two sites. And they got an equal number of bees dancing for both sites, an equal number of bees visiting both sites. But over time, if we assume that the one on the right is the higher quality site, then what we're going to see is we'll get more scouts checking out that site at any instant in time than the other site. And on the bivouac, we'll get more bees dancing for that site than dancing for the other site. And at some point of time, there will get, there will be enough bees dancing for one site or at another site. And we're not actually sure at this point whether the bees are paying attention to the number of dancers or the number of bees at the site. But we know it's one of those two or both, I guess. But once you reach what we call a quorum, then instead of a bee coming back and doing a dance, she initiates this behavior called piping, where they basically start ramming into the bivouac and, and by doing this, it warms up the, uh, it's, it actually, it, it's a signal for the, all the other bees that have been hanging out there to start vibrating their, uh, their flight muscles without 
um, you know, connecting their wings yet. And that warms up their flight muscles. And once all of their flight muscles are warm, they lift off in a big swarm, and then they start flying to the nest that was ch chosen by the bee that started, the bees that started doing this piping behavior. Um, and so it's interesting, there might be thousands of bees in the bivouac. Only like 20 bees know where this is. So those thousands of bees take off and they fly at one speed, call it speed X. The 20 bees that know where the site is, they fly at twice that speed in circles around the periphery of the swarm. And the bees, as they're flying, see these high, fly, high, these high speed bees going around ahead of them. And, that, and they have a tendency to orient their flight towards the fast bees. And so these streaker bees end up like steering a ship. They end up steering the swarm to this location that they found. So it's a very small number of bees that get thousands of bees to this tiny little hole in a tree somewhere. And that's how the process ends. And once they all move in to that tree, then all the, you know, the nest site scouts, they just fold back into the colony and go off and do other things because they found a nest. They don't need to do scouting for nests anymore. And so that's how this process of nest site selection ends for the honeybees. Question. Oh, excellent question. So um, this, uh, it can take anywhere from a couple of hours to a day ish. So if you were to go out, let's say, um, you know, the Shesh Hall or whatever, and you were to see like one of these bivouacs hanging out there, uh, or out next to the bookstore, sometimes they like to hang out there, um, you might um, see them all day, but you come back the next day and they'll be gone. And when they're gone, that indicates that they have uh, found a site. And, uh, and actually, if you happen to be around when they start piping, it's audible. And uh, as they start vibrating their wing muscles and warming themselves up, and so you can actually hear them after, as a decision is being made. And then soon after that, you can watch the whole thing take off and fly. So any other questions? Pro tip, most of the um, honeybee, wild honeybees in this area are Africanized. It's something I can talk about at a different time. It's sort of not really related to this, but it basically means that um, they're extremely aggressive they're not aggressive when they're in this state, but if you have me walking around in the middle of the desert um, and there's uh, and you happen to be close to them when they're moved in to a cavity somewhere, they will be very defensive of that cavity. And if one of them stings you, she releases an alarm pheromone that will attract a lot more to you. And people can die from this. And the thing I'm bringing up is it turns out that, the, that one of the chemical compounds in that alarm pheromone is also in bananas. So you never eat a banana in the desert because you can call, you can attract uh, Africanized bees to you. It can be very, very dangerous. So never eat a banana in the desert. All right. Any other questions about this? All right. So um, that's bees. That's how they do it. And they kind of like a slime mold, temporarily distribute themselves across alternatives, gradually build up. Um, uh, you know, a, 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 according to quality, and then eventually have the ability to make a decision where they can move the whole thing into the highest quality one. So it's like a combination of the sort of trail laying, the linear and the nonlinear recruitment. They can sort of recruit linearly while they're gathering information and then switch and then decide to exploit the one that where the, the highest distribution's at there. And so that's bees. And so the question is, what about ants? Well, um, I've talked about trail laying ants. Now, there are different types of ants who use a different type of recruitment strategy that I talked about a little bit at the end of, of last time, um, which is a linear recruitment strategy with ants. It is not trail laying. And, um, and these ants are a great example of it. Um, these are ants of the genus Timothorax. These are Timothorax regatulus. There are a number of different Timothorax species that behave this way. These are ants you can find here in Arizona in rock crevices. So if you go up to uh, Globe, you climb up in the mountains where it's cooler, you can crack open rocks and they live like bees in crevices. And, um, and so uh, this little nest uh, entrance here, uh, you can hold that, that fits about in the palm of my hand. So they're relatively small ants. The nests only have like 300 ants, maybe tops, so 100 to 300 ants. Um, there's a queen kind of in the middle here. You might be able to see that as this gets bigger in some of these, these future slides here. Um, they're just big enough though that we can paint them with four paint dots. So just like the bees, we can track every single ant 
and then end up sort of figuring out how they solve these problems at an individual level. So that's kind of a cool thing. So, um, you know, comparing these ants, I showed this result last time. I kind of highlighted it a little bit more. Um, I've talked about linear versus nonlinear recruiting. And so pheromone trails are referred for as nonlinear recruiting. And so if I look at this kind of uh, this, this uh, example curves up here, um, we've got a number of recruiters for a feeder on one, on a probability of a new recruit choosing to go to that feeder on the other axis. And for pheromone trails, basically pheromones at low concentrations are almost undetectable. But once they get to high concentrations, then they're hard for any ant to ignore. So as a consequence, it's very hard to get graded recruitment to one particular site. It's pretty much the site that has the strongest smell um, will eventually cross some threshold and bring all of the ants to it. And so that's how nonlinear recruitment works. Now, in a second here, I'll show you how ants implement linear recruitment. And honeybees, linear recruitment is like the waggle dance because Every dance, um, regardless of where you are in the process, every dance is only going to be seen by, you know, five bees. So the probability that those five bees will go off to the site that you're dancing for is the same, regardless of how many bees are dancing for that site. So the number of the, or I guess I should say the probability of shooting, choosing one site or one feeder scales with the number of bees dancing with it. It's not this sort of threshold thing. And so it looks more like this red line where as you get more dancers, you get more probability and it's a smooth curve. And that gradation there, that smoothness is what allows um, bees to allocate in, uh, in proportion to quality. And as we'll see ants as well to allocate in proportion to quality. And so these ants that I just showed you, um, I haven't showed you how they do it yet, but um, this is an example where a grad student here, former grad student, Zach Schaefer, set up an experiment where he gave these ants 0.8 molar, so not uh, so very sweet sugar water solution, not so sweet sugar water solution. And he waited for them to allocate out. And so you end up getting ants at both feeders, but more of them at the higher, uh, the sweeter feeder. And then he switched them in the lab. And then after a short amount of time, then they switched their allocations so that they followed that. So they're able to track these quality distributions um, in time. And that's because of this linear recruitment that they can do. All right, so any basic questions about this idea of nonlinear and linear recruitment, this, uh, you know, the probability of being recruited either smoothly changing or abruptly changing like a regime shift? Okay. All right, so um, these ants then allow, this allows them to do the deliberation that honeybees do and that slime mold do. So with these ants, I can go in here. So this is uh, an, an ant colony. Um, I took this picture. So um, again, this is, fits about in the palm of my hand. That's balsa wood. There's a glass slide on the bottom and I've taken the glass slide off the top. And that exposes the, the, their, um, well, in this case, I think the picture still has a glass light on the top, but that's how I can just take the glass light off the top and that destroys their nest. And that will kick off the process, just like the bees, the bivouac on the tree branch, they'll start looking for a new nest at that point. And I can give them different nests. Um, you know, so this one uh, might have a very tiny entrance size, but it's very bright. This one has a very large entrance size, but it's dark. And then I can ask them to, I can see how often they move in to these different types of sites. And it turns out that there's a, just like the honeybees, there's a bunch of different things that they weigh when they're choosing sites. And so darkness and entrance size are one of the things that are easiest for us to manipulate in the lab. So we often talk about that. They like darker nests and they like smaller entrance sizes. So we're, we're saying smaller is up and darker is to the right. And so nest A, um, which is, I think, um, this is gonna be to have the large entrance size. Um, I'm sorry, it has a small entrance size, but is, is not very dark, that's here. Nest B is very dark, but has a not so small entrance size. That's this one down here. So you should start getting that kind of Pareto optimal multi-criteria feel here. And so you can think that um, there's sort of maybe a set of nests that just don't exist or up in this corner that would be both have really tiny entrance sizes and also really dark. And then there's a set of nests down here that you should never pick if these nests exist because these nests are gonna be better than any nest that's down here. 
And so we can then start playing with that. And so we can give them a decoy nest. So here's a nest that has the same entrance size as nest A, but it's even brighter. Well, there's no reason I would ever choose that one because if I like that one for any reason, I'm gonna like this one better. Likewise, this one down here, this one is the same darkness as this one, but it has an even bigger entrance size. Nest because if I like this one, I'm gonna always like this one better. So, um, so that's the way we can add these decoys. Now, you do this with humans and humans are really terrible about it. So the classic kind of examples and sort of, um, so for example, the Washington, I think it was the Washington, no, it was the, um, uh, the, it was like the Economist. The Economist once said they had these subscription packages and they said, we have a subscription package you can do, um, you can get our um, online only subscription package. And it was, you know, I don't know, a hundred dollars a year or you can get our um, online and paper-based version for $500 a year, or you can get our online and paper-based version for $1,000 a year. Now the third option was identical to the second option. And they ended up saying, oh, that was a mistake. And they took the third option away. So there are only those two options there. But the economists, they kind of know what they're doing. Um, when you give this sort of these irrelevant alternatives that no one picks, in humans, it tends to change their preferences for the ones that they do pick. This is the same reason why if you ever walk into a bike shop and you say, I just need like a one speed bike or something like that, a fixed gear, a fixie or something like that that's cheap. Um, and then I happen to notice that there's something with fixed features that, so the cheap ones might be a hundred bucks. Uh, the one with six features might be 250 bucks. And the one with seven features. So you'll be looking at those two. And then the salesperson will come over and say, hey, before you make a decision, have you considered this one over here that has one more feature? And it's $3,000. And you'll say, I would never buy a $3,000 bike that only has one more feature than a $250 bike. But then even though you came in for the fixie, you start thinking more about the $250 bike. And that's playing on your psychology, that humans have this irrationality about them. And, and that's exactly this right here. So that's called an, an uh, irrelevant alternative. And, um, and the rational thing is, it's called the IIA principle, the independence of irrelevant alternatives. If we are rational agents, if you offer me an irrelevant alternative, it will not affect my preferences for the alternatives I'm actually choosing between. And the question is, how do ants handle that? Um, and so, um, we can ask that question both at the individual level, how does an individual ant handle that problem, and at the group level. And that's um, one of the things that this former grad student who's now a faculty member at UGA um, uh, did in his thesis. So I'm gonna just show a kind of a quick uh, overview of the three big results that came out of his thesis where he sort of studied rationalities in these ants and pitted individuals against groups. And so Taka uh, did exactly um, the kind of study that I was, I was talking about there, where he gave um, these ants the A and B nest, but also the decoy A and the decoy B. And what he found here is that um, the, he had the things titrated so that without the decoys, the A bar and the B bar were equal. So it, there's an equal chance of you choosing either one of them. And then he took those same ants, and when he introduced the decoy, they never chose the decoy. But whichever decoy he gave them caused them to move into um, a related nest that so basically shift their preference. And so the decoy tricked them into individual ants, into overweighting certain criteria in ways that they didn't before the decoy was introduced. The same way the introduction of the $3,000 bike might make suddenly the $250 bike seem a little more attractive. So individual ants, now how do you give an individual ant a, 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 a question like this? You give it a pile of brood, just eggs, for, for example. You put eggs right there, you put a nest, a nest, and a decoy nest, and, um, and then you, you just lay the individual there and you wait. And eventually she will move those brood into a nest and you see which one she moves it into. And it turns out that individuals are affected by that decoy effect. Are there questions about that? Before I get to the punchline about the groups? That makes sense. Now, the cool thing is that then you can give the groups the same challenge. So now instead of putting a pile of brood in front of an individual, you just destroy a nest and then you give them these alternatives. 
And then you see where does the group go? And so what Taka found is that um, there was no decoy effect. So even though there looks like uh, there's a trend here, these are not statistically significantly different. And on top of that, um, even if the trend was in, invalid, it's moving in the opposite direction that the decoy effect would normally go in. And so the groups are rational, even though the individuals are not. So this suggests to us, uh, to, as you know, as from sustainability science or thinking about human systems, that if we can figure out how uh, how ants are integrating information, we can build um, mechanisms of information aggregation in human systems that can take a bunch of irrational humans and help to guarantee that the group stays rational. So that's one of the reasons why we think it's important to understand what's going on inside these ants. All right, so one of the other cool things that Taka did is said, well, you know, preferences exist at the colony level. Where are those preferences stored at the colony level? There was a question earlier about memory and slime mold and whether it really counts to be memory if it's externalized to the slime mold. And then actually, if you read that paper, and I think I've now put that paper on the Canvas site, they actually uh, are suggest that perhaps externalized memory of the slime mold was an evolutionary precursor to the internalized memory that we have. And so you can imagine other ways to store memory. It might be memory inside an individual ant, or it might be preferences somehow stored within the group. So Taka was interested in that. And so he said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give um, a pre-treatment group where I've got my, my normal nest, my standardized nest, and I'm going to give them uh, two choices, uh, a nest that has a tiny entrance but is bright or has a bigger entrance but is very dark. So we can call this the light nest. So it's got, it's, you know, it's darker, it's better in the light dimension, and this is better in the entrance dimension. And we're going to measure their preference. So maybe it'll be 60, 40, you know, 60% for this one, 40% for this one. Every um, colony might have a slightly different preference, but we're going to measure it for every colony. And then we're going to take colonies and maybe we'll do a hundred colonies in this, or uh, yeah, say a hundred colonies in, in this pretreatment. And then 50 of them, we're gonna put in a intermediate treatment, we're gonna call the light treatment, where we take whatever nest they're in as standard, we destroy that and we give them a choice between the standardized nest and a nest that um, has the same entrance size as the standard nest, but is brighter. Or the other 50, we're gonna put them in what we call an entrance treatment, where they destroy the standard nest, give them a choice between a standardized nest and a nest that has a really big entrance, but is the same darkness, as the entrance treatment. Now, the analogy we, the, the talk would like to make here is like, um, let's say you live in a neighborhood that has houses that have fireplaces and swimming pools. And there's a value to having a fireplace and there's a value to having swimming pools. Some houses might have both, some houses may only have one, some houses might have a small one of each, whatever. Um, and so you end up deciding that you like fireplaces more than swimming pools or whatever. And then you live for another couple, you move, and you live for a couple of years in a neighborhood where everyone's got the exact same swimming pool, but some people have fireplaces and other people don't. Or you imagine moving into a neighborhood where everyone's got the exact fireplace, but some people have swimming pools and other people don't. Um, and so now you're, you've experienced this, uh, you've now learned that in this new neighborhood, there was an informative cue that's not informative anymore. So it, you know, if everyone's got a swimming pool, then you just stop worrying about whether swimming pools are, they're just don't become part of your decision matrix because you know that if everyone's got a swimming pool, what you just have to focus on is whether they have a fireplace. So you forget even asking, do you have a swimming pool? Because you just take for granted that everybody has a swimming pool. And so that was kind of Taka's question is if, if I push them through this, will they also forget, like in this one here, where the only thing that differs in all three nests is the entrance size, maybe they'll forget about their preference for lighting. Or up here, um, if the only thing different in here is the lighting and all the entrance size is the same, maybe they'll forget to check for entrance size. So then he took the, the 50 here and the 50 here and he put them all back into a post-treatment test that was identical to the pre-treatment test to test their preferences. And what he found is that the preferences shift in the direction of the cue that was uh, you know, reinforced or the away from the cue that was lost. So 
um, ants that went through the pretreatment area where entrance size was the only thing that differed, they now had a much higher preference than before for entrance size post-treatment. Ants that went through this treatment here where lighting was the only thing that was different, they had a much higher preference for lighting in the post-treatment than they did in the pre-treatment. And so that shows that ants' preferences are plastic at the colony level. Now we still to this day don't know if individual ants are shifting their individual preferences, and that's what's driving this, or if it's some network effect, and this plays into, we're about to read about networks um, coming up in, uh, in not the next unit, but the unit after that. Um, we don't know, it could be a network effect. It could be that there are ants that check for entrance size and that there are ants that check for lighting. And if the ants live in an area where lighting doesn't matter, the lighting scouts just like forget to ever do their job. They just fall out. It's like that part of the workforce is gone. And maybe that's where the preference is. Maybe they're stored in the demographics of the workforce of the ants, not in any individual ant. So that's kind of the cool result here. Are there questions about this result, this idea that groups can have preferences that emerge from the interactions of the individual and those preferences can change? Yeah. Oh no, so um, so this this was like, they spend enough time to move into a nest, which might be 24 hours. So you imagine 24 hours, 24 hours, 24 hours. Um, these ants have very long kind of generation times. In fact, um, there was a paper written by another group where they found that you could starve these ants and workers would survive for at least nine months. And they say, well, you know, why didn't, you know, they measure it further than that? That was the length of an academic year. So they put like an undergraduate student on the study thinking that it would take a certain amount of time and that undergrad would have a nice poster to present. And it came to the end of the, the thing and all of the ants were still like, and all of their treatments were still alive. And they said, well, we know they lived for at least an academic year without any food. So like, yeah, these, these ants have sort of long generation times. Um, they're very slow tempo. And so, um, so that's a great question about um, the how you can inherit these memories. Now, there are other ants that people have um, done cute things like they're harvester ants, like the ones that live um, in kind of near Phoenix. And, uh, and those, you can actually do things like have them sort ribbon or sort a uh, little wooden ball or sort some other things like different sorting tasks. And then you can measure how good they are at sorting that. So they, they, they end up forging for it and they put it in little piles and how well do they get them like in that pile. And the crazy thing about it is that some sorting tasks are heritable and other ones aren't. So you can actually see what new colonies, so you can watch over several years, because every year you get a new colony and you can, and you can genotype. Um, and so you can actually follow, um, you know, which daughter colony you know, came from which mother colony. And like sorting ribbon was something that was highly heritable. So that if a colony is really good at sorting ribbon, then so would the daughter. But sorting like wooden ball was something that was totally random. So you didn't inherit that. So there, there are crazy sort of group level properties that are heritable or, and not here, but we don't know a whole lot about where they're stored and those sorts of things. So it's a great question, yeah. Well, so it's like um, in most ants, it's kind of like that leaf cutter example where the virgin queen, it's not like the honeybees where she gets to keep a colony, a partial colony. In, in most ants, the virgin queen flies away alone after mating, so now she's mated, and she starts a small colony. And it may take her five to 10 years to build up enough workers to really be at the same level as the colony that she left. So, and she might not even start being re reproductive for a couple of years as she's building those things up. It's, um, colonies go through a juvenile period, just like, you know, uh, you know, mammals have puberty, right? So like, you know, up until puberty, you're just growing into your body and ant colonies are the same sort of way. They don't actually start producing sexuals until a particular point that they're kind of ready to do that. Any other questions about this sort of idea of colony level preferences? The last example um, here is, um, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, this was the data. Um, so uh, before treatment, you can see before treatment, um, both of the preferences were right in the middle here. So this is the preference for darkness, the preference for entrance sizes. So um, 
this is, you can think of the entrance treatment was one of those branches, the light treatment was the other branch. Um, but then the entrance treatment, you found that when they went to the one where entrance was the only informative cue, then after that, they shifted their preference towards entrances. If they go where light and darkness is the only informative cue, then after that, then you get a statistically significant increase in their preference for darkness. All right, so the last example I want to give of these cool ants and the things they do, and I mentioned this last time a bit, is that you can give individuals and groups um, either a single pair of a poor nest and a good nest. So here's our home nest. This is going to get destroyed. And then you get a poor nest or a good nest. So again, the individual, you give her a pile of brood, see which one she moves into. The groups, you just destroy the nest, see where the group ends up over time. Um, or you give them four pairs. We have four poor nests and four good nests. And you see which one they choose. And so when you do this, you find that isolated individuals um, so if I go back to this arena here, if I put an isolated individual with a pile of brood, that one ant will go around and she'll visit almost every one of these nests before she decides to move the brood into one of them. Um, but what, as these data will show, um, if, um, if this is a colony, not an isolated individual, then individuals from that colony only visit one, maybe two nests before they come back to the colony and participate in the decision-making. So remember, we can paint every individual and track what they do. Um, and so that's what this is showing. So um, isolated individual visit almost every nest, um, but individuals in the group treatments um, visit one, maybe two nests. That's what's kind of being shown here. Now, uh, isolated individuals, these data here, show that when you give them just a pair of nests, they're pretty good at choosing a good nest. They will move the brood into a good nest. But when you give them four pairs of nests, so now there's four poor and four good, it's cognitive overload. They just cannot pick out a good nest. And they basically just choose a random nest to move the brood into. So it just goes to chance. And that's what's being shown here. It's just, you know, they're just picking randomly. And that's why it's an equal probability to hit a poor as they do hit a good. But the interesting thing is when you give groups the same challenge, then you get uh, basically no effect of the cognitive overload. Um, in both the two nest and in the eight nest uh, case, you get um, the group will move into a good nest. Um, so somehow cognitive overload gets mitigated. And we think one of the ways it gets mitigated is the information aggregation um, allows individual ants to focus on just one nest at a time. So rather than saying, um, I'm gonna pick, you know, each have each one of you go out and check out every restaurant in Tempe and then come back and we'll all vote on what's our favorite. It's more like, I'll ask you to visit there, I'll ask you to visit there, I'll ask you to visit there. And then you all come back and then you've got some absolute ranking scale. And maybe if six of you visited um, you know, whatever, Shake Shack, and six of you uh, visited, um, I don't know, some other shack, then the uh, then maybe if we averaged your scores, then on average, you might have picked this group of six, might have picked a two as their ranking, this group of six might have picked a four as their ranking, um, and then we can compare those averages and maybe go with the four. So it seems like reducing the comparisons at the individual level but then providing a way for individuals to aggregate allows us to mitigate overload in groups. And that's another another example of a potential architecture we could use in human systems, because we know that humans also get cognitive overload. So if we task humans correctly, we can beat their individual cognitive overload and still have groups make decisions that compare among a lot of them. So questions about that result? All things that these little ants can do. Okay. And so um, my claim was this is all due to um, them being able to do their version of the waggle dance, their version of linear recruitment, allows them to spread things out and then integrate information and make choices. So what does that look like? All right, well, so imagine I just destroyed um, this nest. About 20 scouts will head out into the arena and start looking for new nests. <clears throat> and again, this is very similar to the honeybee case. And, um, and then, you know, like I said, they can have these complex um, preferences. So this ant can really like dark spaces. 
uh, or and she also can really like small entrances. And so when pitted, you know, a dark uh, space with a large entrance or a or a small entrance with a, a light space that has to, you know, somehow come up with, you know, which one she prefers. But eventually she'll pick one that she prefers. And um, and then uh, she will start bringing ants, as we'll see in a second, to the one that she prefers. But just like with the honeybees, every time she goes back to the one that she's bringing ants to, she does what's referred to as quorum sensing. Again, similar to the honeybees. And, um, and she starts to sort of notice that there ends up being more and more ants in the one that she's going to. And, um, and then so eventually, once they hit a quorum, then there is, and I'll show you what it looks like here in just a second, an ant version of the piping behavior, where once quorum has been reached in this nest, the ant will go back and will start a process that will move all of the ants into the nest that reached quorum. So that's what I'm saying here, sort of phase three. And then they sort of start doing whatever it is ants do um, once they're all together um, in, you know, as a colony again. So if you've never seen the B movie phase four, I recommend it, some great ant wrangling. But let's focus on how they do that, what this sort of waggle run looks like for ants. So, um, so this ant right here has found a new nest site. And so she comes back to this nest here and she waits for um, an ant to touch her on the rear end. And then she does this kind of pas de deux where the ant walks a few steps and keeps waiting for the ant behind her to touch her again on the rear end to tell her that she can iterate one more time. And this process goes on in little step by little step by little step. And eventually what's gonna happen is that this ant back here, notice that the ant in the back, she keeps kind of turning her head back and forth. As far as we can tell, it looks like she's encoding the visual landscape. So the, the first ant is just walking ahead waiting while the second ant is looking around and say, all right, there's a landmark, there's a landmark, there's a landmark, got it, next. And then goes up, all right, new landmark, new landmark, new landmark, got it. And we think this is how the ant in the back is learning the route. Now she will eventually get to the new nest site and the lead ant will leave her. will just come around and might come back and lead another one of these so-called tandem runs. This uh, follower will now have the opportunity to check out the new nest and see what she likes. She might like it a lot, she might not. If she likes the new nest, she can then come back and start leading these tandem runs. And so that, this is sort of their equivalent of the waggle dance. Instead of dancing to encode direction uh, and distance, they bring one ant, one at a time, to a new nest, um, and that's how they teach the route. All right, so any questions about this before I switch to their kind of commitment behavior, which is like the piping behavior after they reach quorum? This makes sense, tandem running. All right, so eventually um, enough ants will accumulate in the new nest site to reach quorum. And what happens there is that an ant, once she's determined that quorum has been reached, um, this ant right here, comes back and she does the ant equivalent of piping. Um, now ants will warm up their flight muscles. She comes back and she'll negotiate with another ant, throw the other ant on her back, as you'll see just in a second here, and then run with her to the new nest, carrying her on her back. At, in a second, you see pretty good speed, much faster than a tandem run. So this is a much faster way to bring an ant to a nest, but the ant that's on the back, she doesn't learn the route. So she's just kind of goes along for the ride, gets dumped at the new area, has no idea how she got there, and she cannot help with any further integration. So the tandem running is teaching the route. The transport is just getting them there. So that's why it's kind of like that piping behavior. And so she'll eventually get to the new nest and then drop her off. And then the one who's doing the transport will then zip back to the other one and do it again and again and again until eventually all the ants are at the new nest. That's transport, tandem and transport. Any questions about that? This is like the ant version of waggle dancing and piping. Okay. So there she goes. She's uh, got in the new nest and she's about to drop her off to the end. All right. So um, now the interesting thing that, that we are interested in, sort of my group and my collaborators' groups, are what triggers this switch. Now, 
Um, Melanie Mitchell in her chapter mentioned, you know, this uh, encounter rates being important. And this is another example of where encounter rates end up coming up a lot. So a um, colleague of mine, Stephen Pratt, showed a while back in 2005 that um, so you can take ants after they visit a nest and you can see what decision they've made, tandem runner transport. And you can then study all the different things that possibly could have triggered their switch from tandem run to transport. And the one thing that consistently predicts whether they've switched into transport is their encounter rate with other ants in the candidate nest. So basically if an ant goes to a candidate nest and she experiences um, a low encounter rate, a low number of ants encountered per second, um, then she is very likely to just leave and do a tandem run. And as the encounter rate increases, she'll keep doing tandem runs. But once the encounter rate crosses some critical value, then the probabilities switch and she becomes very likely to do a transport. And this, you can have large nests, small nests, um, it doesn't matter. Encounter rate seems to be a great predictor of when they do the switch. Now, we re looked at these data afterwards to sort of start studying a little bit more of how the ants are making this decision that they've reached the critical encounter rate. And we noticed something interesting. And that was that Thank you. 